So helioseismology, um, the word itself comes from seismology, which is the study of um, basically earthquake waves on earth. So seismic waves are generated on earth by earthquakes. And uh, you can think of helioseismology as the study of those same waves in the sun. So um, what happens is that the, there are basically, the, the material in the sun can move slightly, just like the material in earth and be perturbed by small changes. And so any small changes that happen in the interior will ripple their way out to the surface of the sun by basically shaking all the material inside. Um, and so it's basically the same as a seismic wave from an earthquake. The internal layers change the way that the waves can actually move through the sun and they can um, th therefore tell us about what's happening on the interior. And these surface patterns that we see have this kind of characteristic shape where the, um, the red, and blue, um, they have different meanings. So uh, let me ask you a poll question. What do you think those meanings are? If I had a red shifted region um, in these solar oscillations, what do you think is happening? All right, so yes, as we um, look at the surface patterns, if we wanna measure motion, then the one good way that we have to do that is by measuring Doppler shifts. And so if we measure the Doppler shift of each point on the surface of the sun relative to the average, then we see that some areas are red shifted, meaning that uh, the surface in that region is moving slightly inward. And in the blue shifted regions, it must be moving slightly toward us. So um, these are small effects, but they are measurable. And the, the pattern that you see is like I don't know if you've ever seen these like chelatiny plates. Let me see if I can show you, a, a, find an example. Okay, so the surface of the sun gets some sort of pattern set up on it and the pattern depends on the, you know, how the waves can actually move through the interior. So a little bit more complicated than the chelatiny plates, but it still sets up a standing wave pattern uh, that responds to changes inside. So. The, the things that we learned from helioseismology are actually pretty important. Um, we talked about last time that the sun has a differential rotation. So when the sun rotates, the sunspots don't um, all rotate at the same speed. The ones at the equator move faster. And it turns out that that differential rotation extends into the sun too. So um, into uh, the convective zone, the sun still rotates at different speeds. But then once we hit the radiative zone, it's like a bowling ball and then it all, or I guess like the lemon and it rotates as a solid body again. So this is important information to know because it tells us um, you know, what we should expect to see from things like the sun's magnetic field and helps us uh, be able to better model the interior of the sun. Um, okay, and then the other thing that we learned from helioseismology is that the amount of hydrogen and helium is basically the same all the way to the core. And this is important because it means that the helium in the sun is only being depleted at the core. Um, and this helps us understand how uh, material is available in the core of stars as they age and um, helps us to better model the ages of stars, their lifetimes. So we'll come back to this, um, you know, the, the mix of fuel in the core changes what a star is able to do and can cause it to start evolving off of the main sequence when the amount of helium gets too low. I mean, sorry, amount of hydrogen gets too low. Okay, one other thing that we learned from helioseismology is how the sunspots manage to persist for long periods of time. And so by being able to map information from the interior, we find that the um, kind of cool region of the sunspot kind of acts like a plug and prevents new hot material from rising up. And not only that, but it pulls in material from outside of the region and that creates a stronger and stronger magnetic field that persists over time instead of dissipating. So the, um, the mechanisms for why sunspots were so persistent um, wasn't understood until we were able to peer inside the sun with helioseismology. So there are some really big collaborations going on. Um, I think quite a few actually um, missions that are looking at the interior of the sun. The most famous, I don't remember what it stands for, but the acronym is GONG, 
which is kind of perfect because if you strike a gong, then it sets up a standing wave pattern. Okay. So the other piece of information we can use to peer inside the sun is neutrinos. So remember that our sun is basically transparent to neutrinos. They do not like to interact with other particles. So they just escape from the fusion process um, pretty much unscathed. And because they are a fusion byproduct, they can tell us more about fusion processes in the interior. So observing neutrinos is really tricky because they don't interact with particles very well. And so if you want to build a detector, it generally depends on interacting with them. And so you have to, you know, play lots of tricks like um, they'll interact with heavy things more than they'll interact with light things. So if you have a lot of heavier atoms that you can put in one place uh, in a very dense way, then maybe you'll have a chance of observing neutrinos. But then you're more um, apt to also observe things that you didn't mean to observe, like cosmic rays. Um, and so these experiments are generally underground and so that they're shielded by the Earth itself. And these neutrino experiments, uh, they started um, in, in the past and found kind of weird things. They found that according to our solar model, there should be more neutrinos than they actually counted up. And so this was disturbing because it meant that maybe our idea of the fusion model was wrong. Maybe neutrinos weren't produced as often as we thought, or maybe they didn't all make it to Earth and something was happening in space in between the Earth and the Sun that we didn't understand. Um, and so this was a paradox for a long time that was called the neutrino problem. And later we came up with a solution to this problem. It turned out that if we used a different type of detector, we could detect different kinds of neutrinos. We didn't even know there were different kinds of neutrinos. Uh, so we were in the original experiments only able to detect electron neutrinos, which are one particular flavor. But there are heavier types of neutrinos that um, we weren't detecting. And it turns out that those can switch into each other. No other particle does that. It's really weird for one particle to just spontaneously change a property. Um, it, it, as far as I know, only happens with neutrinos. So um, this, what is called neutrino oscillation was a real interruption to our understanding of neutrino physics and also really important for high energy physics and understanding the whole set of fundamental particles that we have. All right, so that's neutrinos. Some of these experiments, it is worth looking at pictures of them. Um, I think that Neil deGrasse Tyson floats around in uh, Super Kamiokande, which is this uh, detector device in Cosmos, the one that came out on Netflix several years ago. And basically Super K is a huge underground detector in Japan. It's all these like shiny bits on the walls are light detectors and it's filled with heavy water. So with water that has heavy isotopes of hydrogen instead of normal hydrogen. So this just, you know, here's some people on a raft inside of it, just to give you a sense of the scale of these experiments. These are some of the biggest experiments in all of science and some of the biggest collaborations. 